the devil right split. Bachelor's life I lead. I boil me eggs in the morning and read the newspaper during the afternoon. something addictive about the exchange of energy between an audience and a, and a band and that's where I get really really excited I suppose when I when, I, when an audience are, are in a room and they're all fired up and and somehow I get the opportunity to fire them up even further you know or, to, or, or I'm given the permission to lead it or to whip it into something else and that for me is very exciting you know uh, and that that side of me the sort of the, the person on a stage and the songwriter are very different characters and somehow they have to live together on a stage and for me it's a very uh, complicated relationship they have actually. An artist or any or songwriter or singer, or, a songwriter or a singer should be able to just get up, sing the words plainly, it's almost like deliver the information and step aside. And yet there's a part of me that wants to express every side of it and wants to fire the audience into a singing part or try to pull everybody in and as long as everybody's experiencing a moment and I suppose for me the best thing about any performance is it has to, there has to be a sense of event at it. I'm not leaving with this feeling See it better best be told And how in the world did you come to be such a lazy love Oh, it's all simple And fit in The path that you are on When I talk in There's no secrets there's just a note that you have gone And all that you've ever owned Is packed in the hall to go oh. And how am I supposed to live without you? A wrong word said in anger and you were gone. Sometimes the band is exactly the engine the song needed because it just, you know, a song will finish itself really quickly with the band because, you know, they'll start playing along to it and suddenly the whole thing has a body and it's got muscles and next, next thing the song is bounding along and it sounds really good and it sort of finishes itself and then other songs, the band sort of land on them and it just crushes them and they're just, you know, they're like tiny butterflies in the band, it's like a big, the big bear, just <laughs> and it's gone. You know, so often, you know, it, it can it can work both ways. I can't
young lad, I saw I saw you two play in uh, the Crow Park, and uh, it really blew me away that this man could stand on that stage and communicate to all those people so brilliantly. And uh, this year we played a similar size venue, and it was our gig, and uh, I was that man standing there, just putting out my energy. And so for me, that was a huge personal, like a like a milestone, a moment in my life where I was kind of like, wow, well I've done that, you know. Burn the maps. I think I think it's probably the first Frames record where I don't hear the influences so clearly. For me, every record we've made, I look at, I listen to the record, and I go, God, I really see what I was trying to do there, or I really. You know, oh, we got a bit too close to the... And it's like you're constantly filtering music through yourself that what you listen to can sometimes become very obvious in your, in your output. But uh, I think our records have definitely... Our records don't uh, absolutely uh, show what we've been listening to, but I would notice it, you know. And some other people have criticised me and they've been nailed on the head sometimes. But uh, I think when we started out, we were just trying to... I guess we were just trying to make songs. It's a case of... What you naturally do is going to emulate your heroes and I think it kind of takes a few years before you actually figure out that you know find your own voice in the whole thing you know? yeah. Occasionally you'll get bits of traditional elements just um, eking out here and there, but uh, I, I very much see the, the frames as a as a as a rock band. I don't see them. I don't see the frames as uh, just an Irish band. I see see the frames as definitely a rock band that can appeal to anybody anywhere in the world. The majority of influence that might come from Irish music is just the the feel and the emotion and the sort of, you know, the passion that w was put into a lot of those old songs when you sing them and, you know, when you grow up singing those songs or have those songs around, you can't help but when you start writing your own songs, you know, carry on that sort of tradition of, uh, of trying to say something, I guess. I think the approach that the, the frames have and probably have fought against it somewhat in recent years is, is that sort of very natural approach to music where you feel it and you play it and you know and it's good and probably in in some of our more recent rec records we've been trying to stand back a little bit and be a bit more sort of cerebral and you know put more thought into what we're doing rather than just sort of playing what comes to you naturally but you can't get away from the fact that that's one of the things that makes the band tick. <laughs> are gold and platinum discs from Glenn's albums. Um, you might notice if you look up that some of them are dedicated to me. In fact, nearly all of them. He would have some dedicated to himself, but once he gets the original, he can then make copies for the family. So he, he got these presented to Catherine Hansard, if you see the, the names on them. This one here is the platinum disc for the frames for the birds it went gold and then it went platinum so we have both of them basically that's my pride and joy that's my glory i saw him going from 
you know, the 18, 19 year old <laughs> shaking the head and, and screaming and roaring through the mic, trying to be heard above loud music, down to actually coming down to more like Leonard Cohen, Bob Dylan. I think he has reached his potential in singing. He's just there now. Whenever I pick up a guitar, when I'm not when I'm not on stage, it's to it's to uh, it's to it's to write something or to, to sort of let something happen, and uh, that's the process. It's a kind of a strange one. I I, I, uh, I mm. with regard to lyrics and stuff like that. As soon as I start to sit, as soon as I sit down and start to to write, I become this kind of awful snob, you know, an awful. I, I start thinking that this needs to make so much sense. It needs to be as good as Dylan, or it needs to be as good as. And then I sort of, I find I lose myself a bit in the kind of intellectual process of trying to be, look smart and be smart, so I just don't. Nowadays I've kind of learned how to just pick up my guitar and, uh, and if, I'm, if I've got the right presence of mind I'll press record on a tape recorder or on my mini disc and uh, record what happens. And, uh, and, and oftentimes the song is written without my, without my knowledge because then I'll go back to the tape recorder maybe a month later, and I'll listen to it, and I'll have a whole completed song sitting there that, that I just did it one day, but just didn't hear it that day. So for me, that's kind of how... That's not, that's, the, that's not the only way it works, but that's the best way for me. This is be called uh, Races. It's going to be on our next record. If I win some races That told me now I'm fastest And it told me now I'm better than anyone And if I ride some horses With great speed over courses It's just cause you waited for me at the line And for you I can win For you I can trust myself I remember the chords, man. Be you I can, be you I can trust myself. When things are flowing and you're writing a bunch of songs, you can, it gets it can get almost very easy. And sometimes when you're going through a bit of a difficult period with with, with your guitar or with music, or you feel like I'm just going through the same chord progression again, or I'm talking about the same subject. When I open my mouth, the same subject seems to be at the tip of my tongue. And sometimes you get really bored with this process and then a few months later you realise that you're actually hitting on totally new ground but you just felt you were just so bored with it, you know. So what's important is to do the work, you know, whether, you're, whether you get something out of it or not, just to get up and actually do it. And that's the thing. And I always, you know, I, I hit on a philosophy when I was very young which was just as long as I've got a guitar in my hand, the chances are I'll write songs. As long as I don't have a guitar in my hand, the chances are I won't write songs. So I've realised that that even, even if it's only for 20 minutes in an evening, just pick it up, play it, press record on the tape recorder, waffle out of your mouth, put it away. You've done a little bit of work, a little, you've constructed something in your head very, very, very slight, and, uh, and you can come back to it. So I've started, I've started a thousand songs, you know, easily, more. And, but I have, I have finished maybe 50. <laughs> Ah! 
comes out. He's like, <laughs> It could have been a drummer. Tonight is a, is a kind of a, a friend of ours, a very good old friend of ours, is um, a well-known DJ called Donald Deneen. And um, he, we heard that he was doing uh, a charity gig. So he asked Glenn to come along and maybe play a few songs. And Glenn, knowing that we were all going to be in town, that um, maybe we'd all do it. So, so nobody in the audience, I think, knows. Although it is Dublin, so I'm sure everybody knows now. But uh, so it should be. It's nice to do something that's um, spontaneous, because usually with, um, especially the kind of the, the bigger you get, or the the more uh, the bigger you, you get, the more organised things are, and the more kind of consultation and planning needs to happen before things. So it's nice to kind of be able to kind of uh, be spontaneous and uh, just turn up. In 1994, I think it was, uh, we had uh, just been dropped from our first record label, uh, Island Records, and uh, we were, like any band in, any, in this situation, we were fucked up and we were not believing in it anymore, and, and uh, we met Don for a cup of tea in Bewley's on Westmoreland Street, and he said, and he kind of turned the frames onto an idea that we didn't know anything about, which was, the idea was that you don't need uh, a record label to make records. And, just being a young, naive band, we didn't know what he was talking about. And uh, he explained that all you have to do is borrow money and uh, <laughs> go into a studio, make a record, and uh, figure it out from there. Once you have your record, then the rest is, uh, is easy enough. And so we did it. And, uh, and so we'd like to thank Donald and Ian that we're still together. It's probably, he probably uh, doesn't necessarily want to hear that, but uh, thanks, Donald. There's nothing good happening on the on the air. It's pretty dead. We we'll go back to Radio One. You can trust it. Talk radio, you can trust. Although in Ireland, you know, we have a especially on Radio One, we've got a lot of documentaries about depression. It's like we, it's like Irish people are obsessed with the obsessed with <laughs> the darker side of nature, you know. And we're, we're a pretty we're, like we're a pretty sort of light nation in many ways, but Jesus, we like to talk about the darkness a lot. I mean, think about it and look at our weather and the way we live. I mean, Irish people live in a constant state of twilight, you know, we're, we're never in direct sunlight for very long. So the sun never really hits the, hits the ground in Ireland. It's usually filtered through a lot of dark cloud. So Irish people live in a constant state of half light. And uh, I think it affects our mood a lot. I think it affects the mood of the music of the country uh, in that we're, uh, we're quite inward, you know, Irish people are quite inward looking, even though we're very good at Irish people are kind of famous around the world for being storytellers and for being, you know, people who kind of guffaw and have a laugh. And but uh, I think ultimately it's because we have uh, we have a lot of darkness in us and we recognise it, which which on the outward side and outwardly appears very funny. 
the fact is it's just recognition. Yeah. I think it's a, I think we're, we're there's a, as Joseph Boyd said, we're, we're doomed to inspiration. Well, we were always into music. All my family are musical. So we were always into music and we could all sing, so, you know, and we loved all the records. And so I used to just play my records all the time, played my records, so they, they just grew up with it, you know, and then there was some songs they'd like and they'd ask me to, you know, learn us that one, ma. So I learned them and they'd sing them, so it was just all the time. I just always played the music. Glenn was always in his room and he'd be playing the guitar and then he'd come down and say, ma, listen to this, what do you think of this? And I'd sing and he'd play and I thought, like, you know, he's, he's wasting his teenage years up in that room just playing the guitar, but I remember this particular night, he started going out busking in Grafton Street and he started doing support gigs with bands and he came in then one night and told me that this particular band wouldn't let him support him anymore. And I said, why? And I don't want to sound too... But he turned around and said, I'm cramping that style, that's what they said. So I knew then, I said, my son has something. This was Glenn's room before he moves out and although my other son is living in there now, we tend to keep it exactly as it was when Glenn was in there. So I'm going to bring his in and show it to you, right? <laughs> That's great, man. Good, good for you. That's kind of what we've been doing, had worked in the past. I think what will work better is finally next, because what will happen is you'll have this kind of, your happy's kind of this funny, weird tempo thing that everybody get really likes, but then as soon as like, uh, right. did you find And then you can just you drop off the point and have a bit of a exactly. hello and, and then, chat. So. then come in on the friendly buzz and... Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Brilliant, mate. Fantastic. Name <laughs> down. Same. You played your cards. It's your 
not to blame And when you want something so The band that you see on stage is actually quite a young band. We've been, we've been making music under the name The Frames for so long, but The Frames that made our first record and The Frames that bust on the street and this band, are, they're, they couldn't be further from each other. They're, as in, there is a thread, sure, that goes through them and, and, we, and we are the same people, but we're very different, you know. There's so much that happens to you between even 19 and 25 as a human being, let alone kind of, you know, into your 30s, so. I think, you know, where you start off, it's total, the, the apprenticeship element. I think at this stage we're, we're actually kind of finally getting our heads around uh, just being able to realise the, 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 the sound in the head that we have, you know, and being able to actually make that, make that, capture that on record. I've nearly left the band a bunch of times. Although there was one time I actually, I didn't actually leave the band, but I was very close, just before we released For The Birds. I thought it was a terrible record. I mean, I, I, I loved making it and I loved the whole process, but just maybe a week before it came out, I panicked and I just thought, this is a terrible record and no one's going to like it and it's over and it's all, you know, the creative juices have all dried up, it's bullshit. You know, what's the point in trying to do this anymore? I should get a job or I should just leave the situation or just, I was freaking out. And I, that happened in Amsterdam, actually. And uh, we were playing in uh, the Melkweg with Tinder sticks and I had a meltdown. <laughs> 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 and uh, I jumped on the next plane home. We were in the middle of a tour and I stopped. And the album came out and it got a great response and everything was fine. But I think it's, uh, it's very natural for somebody who's creative to panic, you know, at the last minute. It happens to me quite a lot. Talking like I never knew you, but that's a lie. Burn the Maps is the first record that I took a part in, actually um, took a part in the writing process. Um, so I'm still finding my feet, but um, I just add whatever I can. Uh, any idea that pops in, I, try to go for it and uh, if uh, if they get if they get excited by it then then it stays if not just <laughs> it's very much sort of everybody getting involved and and even in each other's parts and sort of you know I think we sort of produce each other if you know what I mean there's always a little bit of everybody's input to try and make it better than you know than just that one person and the same with the band when everybody comes together it's to try you know, the idea would be that five people would be better than one person. And he's left you in Korea again. And you're always on my mind. And you're telling me I should. So you have this kind of bright orange thing all the way around. And then uh, 
a bunch of lights pointing in at us, blasting us kind of orange, but only from kind of the knees up, off from the sort of feet up. So that basically the top half of our body is kind of in darkness, but the bottom half is really floodlit. Yeah? So what you'd have then is you'd have loads of that kind of, you know that light where if a bit of rain or a bit of dust or something falls, it's caught really clearly. So that our silhouettes, because the trees would be lit so intensely, and even though our faces are in relative darkness, will be really high contrast against the background. The fact that the, uh, the, the park commission approved it yeah. and said go after not after not allowing anything like that to happen for what 100 years or something? Yeah, something like 100 years. That was amazing. We had this idea a few months ago to do a gig here um, on Halloween night and that it would be a it would be a very uh, impromptu thing. And then the idea was to have some cameras on top of some of the buildings outside the square. And only at the end of the performance, the camera would pan off and you would see that this gig took place in the middle of town. Because it looks like we're in some kind of nature. And then, but you don't know it, you can't feel it until the camera would pan off and you'd see that we're in the centre of Dublin. People got so excited about it that the national network got involved and, and what happened was the idea then got railroaded or got hijacked and we had to, for insurance reasons and for a bunch, of, a bunch of problems came into play. The big one being crowd control. They thought that if, if we put on this concert that you'd have a thousand, two thousand people, five thousand people showing up to the park and that you would have chaos. ACDC would have been something he played as music when he, music when he was a kid, and he'd he'd get me to embroider. He wore all these denim jackets, and every one he bought, I had to embroider ACDC across the back of the jacket. I took my confirmation name as uh, Angus, and I kept. I was very a anxious because I didn't know if there was a, if there was a saint because he had to take a saint's name, and I didn't know if there was a saint Angus. When you make your confirmation, you take your name by meeting the bishop. So all the kids are queuing with their parents to meet the bishop, you know, who's like a big deal. He's come in from Ballymun from somewhere outside. And so he's sitting there and meeting him is like meeting the Pope, you know, it's like a really big deal. And uh, we were on the queue and anyway, we got to him and uh, he said, yeah, hello, Glenn. Uh, so what's your, you know, what name do you want to take? And I said, Angus. And, uh, and, he, and he was like, that's very, that's very unusual. Huh? Well, well done. <laughs> and Lima said, it's the fella on the cover of Highway to Hell, you know, with, with the horns. And the, the bishop was just like, ah. And he was great, actually. He was like, oh, OK, well, go ahead. Very good. So uh, <laughs> that was gas. Uh, we're going out to um, a friend of mine, Luca Bloom, is, uh, is having a, a kind of a session or a get together uh, a few songs and he has this every couple of months and it's a, it's always a really enjoyable thing and I'm really into being there because I'm not around a whole lot you know so uh, sort of being back home is like a, a good chance to get to see some of my friends and really nice atmosphere because I was a street musician I you know from from the age of 13 when I moved out of my I moved out of my mother's house very young Pretty much, I mean, I didn't actually sort of officially move out, but I practically moved out by the, by, by, just due to the fact that I, uh, I went and stayed with a lot of friends and I sort of um, very much entered a whole new community because I'm from the, Dublin is separated into two halves. Like most towns, they're based around a river. And uh, Dublin is, uh, the, the Liffey is sort of cuts Dublin in two. And I'm from the north side, which uh, I suppose, you know, would be kind of considered the more working class side of town, even though there are many working class sides of town on the south side, but it's the more kind of, uh, sorry, I suppose the poorer side of town. Uh, so when I was young, I never went over to the south side, to Grafton Street at all. Uh, and then uh, when I left school, I went over to Grafton Street for the first time and uh, met a whole new sort of circle of friends and a new bunch of people that I really enjoyed being with. And I suppose, uh, <laughs> became a outsider without without I, I sort of became a, somebody who 
wasn't anymore sort of in, in, a, in any particular class, but I think that's one of the great things about musicians. It, it's a classless profession. I need to write songs. I don't know if there's any need in me at all as a human being to be a creative, to be a songwriter. Honestly, don't. I honestly don't know if that's true. I certainly do need to play, but I could probably just as easily play someone else's music as play my own. I enjoy my own music, but you know, not 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 to the point where I think it's the best music in the world or anything like that. Well, there is this hollow in my chest. This time I won't forget There is no comfort in the eyes That put us always to the test I can't prepare myself for that But I'll work it out in time There is a love that flows between us Ever changing every day I worked myself up to a crawl No, I'm not fearing it at all We have no reason left to stay and it's why we're leaving, yeah Well, there was no answer in the dust And a woman out there to trust There is this light that drags us beating Falling into disappointment And this Grafton Street would have been a place where it was for the upper class. The south side of the city would be where the knackers of, of Dublin, if you like. That's what the commitment says. <laughs> if you live on the north side, you're, you're lower class. That's not to say that everyone on the north side is lower class. Well, no. Well, they're not. But we were. <laughs> well, I would never, ever walk up Grafton Street. I wouldn't have the confidence to go up to Grafton Street one time. So now I would never seen my son busking because that's where he busked. It was, I suppose, Glenn was the one that really, I suppose, opened my eyes to, you know, Grafton Street is for you and is for people like us. You know what I mean? Because at one time I wouldn't, I genuinely wouldn't walk up Grafton Street. I never busked for money. I only ever busked for the, for the experience. I was, it was all about education for me. It was all about this is my new course in life and I need to learn my craft. And what was attractive for me about Grafton Street was that poets hung out in Grafton Street and sold their poetry on the streets and that other musicians, you know, and sometimes famous musicians walked by. I mean, I had everybody walk, walk past me, you know, 
all the like famous people who'd come to town would everyone would go and shop on Grafton Street. So for me, Grafton Street was like the was the place that was full of potential. You know, like I was playing a Van Morrison song one day, and Van Morrison came along, and was watching me watching me sing his song. So for me, that was the excitement was the was the opportunity that somehow on Grafton Street your career begins. At an apartment in the city. Me yeah, and a red light living there It's been years since the kids have grown A life of their own They left us alone Oh, John and Linda living on my heart And Joe is somewhere on the road. We lost, we lost baby in the, in the Korean, Korean War. And I still don't know what for. Don't matter anymore. You know that old trees just grow stronger. Say hello in there. Although my father was a baritone singer and my mother was a beautiful singer, in those 12 children, every one of us could sing. And most of us threw our little clubs in the area, learned how to play instruments. I didn't know, but my brothers did. We could have been something. That's why when Glenn showed the potential, I went all the way, because I do believe that we lost, we lost out, we all had voices, but we were put in the choir, in the church. That was the only way I could, we could express ourselves in voice, was in the church. I was never afraid of the class system. You can sing for the King of England if you have a good voice. You don't necessarily have to be from good stock, you know? So for me, this was always the, uh, being a musician was the key. It was the way out of seeing myself in any particular place. I don't have a choice in this. It's a road I've come upon. You can join it if you want to. And down here, Nothing gets a chance It's a world too big for us We can burn this bridge I'll stay in here Well, this might take a while To figure out now So don't you rush in And hold your head up high Right through the doubt now Cause it's just a matter The person that I am when I sing is different to the person I am as I live. And it's subtle, but it's different. And it's very important that it's different, because if I was, if I was speaking a plain language, as plain as I speak, then uh, my music would mean so much more to me, and it would hurt me so much more if people responded to it in certain ways or, or didn't like it. And so I think it's very important, it's very important for anybody who's creative to be able to step slightly away from who they are when they're making their doing their thing, whatever that happens to be. There's a bad bone inside of me 
All my trouble started there And all the cracks are adding up to be A little more than you can bear When I met you, you were bitter still Sky, you're never gonna show. And I was cursed with a jealousy. It's killed every love I've ever known. And oh, what's the point in holding out? For a love that only can destroy And when the anger that you feel Turns to poison in your soul And when the sky's your only fear Start to For me, there's something about the word entertainer that's a bit cheap. There's something that denotes uh, trickery. You know, that I do X, I do this, and then I do this, and then it gets this result. You know, and then I, and I, it's almost, you feel like you're hiding the, your, the rabbit in your back pocket, you know, and I don't like this idea. And yet, when I, like, yet when, I, when, when we're on stage, I see I turn into a different character that I don't really recognise. And this is the thing that I have this thing with me band where, you know, we walk on a stage and the boys are like, Glenn, try to, you know, try not to go, go too far away from us tonight because something happens with the adrenaline or the situation and I'm off and I'm slipped into a new gear. Uh, but I'm aware of it now, of course. We're quite a, a contained sort of unit as far as, you know, like Glenn does the artwork and Rob does some of the recording and I'd help Rob out with the recording and um, so we all sort of take on roles work-wise to do with the band and probably, yeah, on a sort of idiosyncratic level, yeah, we probably all have our part to play in the band, you know, Rob will be the calm, together, collected, logical one and, you know, I'll be just, I'll be the lazy, flaky one and Glenn will be the, you know, emotional, sort of uh, fiery one, you know, and Cullen likewise, so, um, yeah, I, I mean, we probably all fit into your standard stereotypes of bass players, guitar players, singers, you know. I think most bands seem to, you know, when you actually look at it, it's unusual to come across people who don't fit into that sort of stereotype. It's also a bit like a, it's almost like a military unit as well. You have the sergeant, you know, Glenn, Glenn will take us out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we have to follow him. He's our, he's yeah. our sergeant or colonel or whatever, leading us into battle. Mm -hmm. And uh, like he said a few times, it, 
Sometimes it'll lead you to victory, and sometimes it'll get us all killed. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but regardless, we you know yeah. we follow them into battle. This situation's killing me. It's got me right under the sun. I don't know where I want to be. But this doesn't make any sense at all. You're quoting every single line. I said too much, but I was old before my time. You yeah, told me you see I want my life to make more sense. I want my life to make amends. I want my life to make more sense. I want my life to make amends. I want my life to make more sense. You got it. I'm feeling. I'm hiding. integral part in progress is the fact that you're questioning things, that you're reevaluating things, that you're, you know, uh, to, to move forward you, you need to kind of question the present and, um, and address your past or whatever. So it's a, it's a constant, um, it's, you know, it, it's good when you wake up in the morning to kind of, it's good to actually answer those questions and be able to say, yeah, I'm, I know where I am and I'm, you know, enjoying what I'm doing, as mm. opposed to it becoming a routine, you know. And also, it's really important to have a sense of humour about it, you know. It's only a fucking band, yeah. you know. And people are, people, people live their whole lives in certain ways and they, they, they sort of, you know, they, they, for a long time I saw the frames as vocational, this is my, this is my vocation, this is it. And I've, in recent years I've begun to look at it as just a band, I mean. And that it's, and that has made me much more relaxed about my position within that group and ironically it's made the whole situation move much freer you know at the end of the day if a band splits up it doesn't end the world it doesn't cause great grief and you know bands split up all the time it's just a creative group of people who get together and do stuff so for me it's very very important to say it's just a band gonna join a fucking band and make it through this trouble night. you say yourself you have a plan. Sense. I want my life to make a mess. I want my life to make more sense. I